Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, ETE, our first session of the morning. Uh, my name is Tom Purcell, I'm a consultant with uh, Chariot Solutions. Uh, and uh, today's speaker is uh, Simon Wardley and he told me to make it short and sweet. So, <laughs> okay, uh, his talk is Crossing the River by Feeling the Stones, uh, Sensing a Business Environment Before Taking Action. Uh, in his abstract, he says, uh, we are, are we simply floating aimlessly being carried by the river? I actually enjoy that when I'm on vacation, but not so much day to day. So hopefully Simon can help me out here. With that, I'll hand it over to Simon. Simon, it's all yours. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, right, we've got a number of people who've joined, which is uh, fantastic. Good to, well, at least see, see the names. Um, can you all raise a hand or shout out or something if you've come across my mapping beforehand. I'll give you a, a couple of seconds just to find at the bottom, you know, the emotion. Uh, oh, do we have the emotion? Oh, just put it in the chat and shout out if you've see, done mapping before. Um, plus one, there's two, three. Okay, so I'm assuming by that, um, that most of you are completely new uh, to my, uh, the way I do maps. Um, so what I will do, therefore, is do a presentation on the uh, sort of basics of mapping. Uh, there's some other stuff we can do in terms of culture, digital sovereignty. I, I'm not sure if we'll get there, um, uh, but so uh, we'll, we'll start with the basics of mapping because we can't do that stuff without it. Um, everything you're going to see is all Creative Commons. Uh, this is stuff I've been using for, gosh, 16 years now. Um, so you just help yourself. And I see, um, oh, somebody's put in a link to online Wardley maps. There's an entire book, uh, um, uh, medium.com forward slash Wardley maps, uh, which is about 600 pages, all so help yourself. Um, so you can learn the basics from them. There's an entire community around mapping. So to get started, what I'm gonna do is share a screen. Don't uh, give that a second. Hopefully it says crossing the river by feeding the stones. Can somebody give me a sort of plus one shout out uh, in the chat if you can see that? See it, perfect, fantastic, right. Okay, so what we're gonna start off with is uh, talk about the origin of how I got into mapping. After which we'll talk about what maps are, what maps aren't. Uh, then we'll get into some basic patterns uh, and uh, then the sort of magical mystery tour, which is the whole sort of everything from meaning to, to digital sovereignty. Not sure if we'll get there, we shall see. Okay, so let's start with the origin, how I got into mapping. So many, many years ago, I worked for this company. Uh, it's called Fatango. It was an online photo service. This was about 2002, 2003. Um, it was doing very well, uh, 16 different lines of business. Um, revenue rapidly growing, uh, very, very, very profitable. Um, and it had about, oh gosh, across all the service by about 2004, roughly, it had about um, close to about 10 million users, I'd had sort of guess, across all the services. Uh, so it was doing well, but it had a big problem. And the big problem was the CEO. The CEO hadn't got a clue what they were doing. They were making it up as they, they went along. They were a fake CEO, totally hopeless. And I know this because I was the CEO. So I used to write all these wonderful sort of statements about, you know, what's our vision and blah, or what our strategy is. So our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. Uh, we'd adopted things like extreme programming. Uh, I'd come across that back in the uh, 1999. So we'd adopted it throughout the organization. Of course, we discovered it didn't work everywhere. Uh, we were heavy users of open source. Uh, but in reality, I'd simply pinch the statement from another company and just changed a few words. So I was getting worried that people would rumble that I didn't know what I was doing. So I used to go around listening to other CEOs talking about strategy, I used to take a tape recorder and I would listen for the short words that they would use. I called them business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blahs for short. And uh, so I used to produce these lists of common blahs. So I've, I've done this every couple of years. Um, actually, the last time was about seven years ago. So that's when this is from. Uh, so the common blahs back in 2014 were things like digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive, blah, 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 blah. 
Okay. If you did it today, you'd probably see, I don't know, AI, uh, you'd probably get, well, blockchain's got to be in there, uh, things like that. So what I also did was grab all these companies, various statements and vision statements, strategy statements they, they made and created what I called the blah template. So our strategy is blah, we will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I would smash the blahs and the blah templates together and also generated at random, um, you know, 64 different strategies, things like this. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focus, competitive advantage and disruptive social media to build a collaborative revolution. And I would circulate these out. Uh, and last time I got about 400 responses uh, of three basic types. Um, the first type was this is the exact wording uh, from our business plan. Uh, second, I've seen two of these used already. And the third and my favorite uh, was are you for hire? So there I was, um, not having a clue what I was doing. I used to go and listen to other CEOs and record the words and created this blah template and randomly generate stuff and send it to others. And they'd go, oh, that's really remarkable. So I was sort of under the impression maybe I wasn't the only one who was making it up. A friend of mine, by the way, has put this all online. Um, this is strategy as a service. If you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL uh, and it will build you one based on nothing whatsoever. Uh, just simply, you know, our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open effort of the market. If you don't like it, it's pretty simple. Uh, just press refresh. And um, uh, you can pretend there's, well, I don't know, blockchain, AI, whatever you want behind it if you feel like it. Uh, but it really is just inserting words into a random template. So I was a bit desperate and I ended up in a bookseller's and I was talking to the book so and she, she persuaded me to buy two copies of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Um, and she explained to me that uh, uh, they're all translations. So they're all slightly different. I'm so grateful for this because I'd read every strategy book I could find. It was getting nowhere. And I'd never, I, I'd never read up The Art of War before. And it was actually in the reading of the second version, I noticed that Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. Uh, one, have a purpose, your moral imperative. Two, understand the landscape you're competing in. Three, understand uh, the heavens, the climactic patterns, so how the landscape is changing, i.e. the weather. Then understand your principles of organization or doctrine, and then you're into the leadership bit. So that's a, that's a bit about deciding where you're going to change things. I was quite excited by this because it sort of made sense. And then I came across uh, John Boyd, so John Boyd uh, wrote something called the OODA Loop, a uh, US Air Force pilot. And just to make it fairly simple, um, you've got the game, that's your purpose. You know, I want to win the game of chess. Uh, the first thing you need to do is observe the environment. And that's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about geographic landscape and weather or, you know, uh, competitive landscape and economic patterns. So you observe the environment and how it's changing. And then you orientate yourself around this space. That's what principles and doctrine are for. Um, doctrine is simply a collection of principles. And then you decide where you're going to attack and then you act and that's the leadership bit. That's where we get all the gameplay. I was like, wow, this, this, this sort of makes sense to me. And at the heart of this are two whys. The why of purpose, as in I want to win the game of chess and the why of movement as in, do I move this piece or do I move that piece? Simple as that. So that was the strategy cycle. And this was probably about 2004. Um, uh, well, maybe early 2005. And I'm, I was quite excited by this. It sort of made sense. And I started to look into this question of landscape. And so I started getting into military battles. And so this is one of my favorite. This is uh, Themistocles, um, ancient politician, Greek general. Um, had a problem, the Persians were invading. Now there were about 140 to 170,000 Persians. Uh, the Greeks were actually independent city-states, often warring with each other, uh, but they would come together in times of need. And basically what happened is they decided to block off the Straits of Artemisium uh, with the Navy, force the Persians along a coastal road into a narrow pass called Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend and slow down a larger force. There are about 4,000 Greeks there, including 300 Spartans. And this is where we get the story of the 300 from. 
I was like fascinated by this because you can see we can use the map to discuss what we're going to do and how we should work together, etc. And I thought, well, how do we do that in my business? So I looked around and one of the things that we commonly used was something called a swap diagram. So I thought I'm going to swap this battle. So um, strengths, uh, a, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, uh, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Uh, opportunities, uh, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian, we actually hate the Spartans. And the threat, the Persians get rid of us and the, well, I added this one later, uh, the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. And I simply put these next to each other and said to myself, what would I use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement described by some sort of map or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram. And it was like obvious to me I'd use a map. And then I thought, well, hang on, I seem to be using SWOTs. So this brought me into the issue of maps. I started looking around and say, okay, where are my maps of my business? And we had loads of maps. Uh, we had strategy maps, uh, we had business process maps, uh, we had mind maps, we had systems maps. So I was quite like, fantastic, with loads of maps. So I took one of the maps and it was a system map. And this was a system for building an online photo service. And I looked at the map and there's a component there, CRM, Customer Relationship Management. And I simply took that and moved it. And then I asked myself, how has the map changed? And the answer is, it hasn't. But if I take a geographic map and I take Australia and I shift it and put it next to say England, has the map changed there? Well, yes. So why hasn't this changed? And the answer to that question is quite simple. It's not a map, it's a graph. In fact, everything we had in business, my maps, systems, uh, strategy maps, systems maps, business process maps, all had one thing in common. They weren't maps, they were graphs. Now to explain the difference very simply, uh, the three images at the top, um, which have three nodes, Nottingham, London, Dover, uh, places in the UK, Nottingham, London, Dover, connect, connected by two roads, M1, M2. The three images at the top are all graphs and they are all identical. Now the three images at the bottom are all maps and they're all completely different. Again, Nottingham, London, Dover, same roads, but they're completely different. And the reason why they're different is because in a map, space has meaning. And that, me that's, that meaning of space comes from the fact that we've got an anchor, as in magnetic north. Uh, basically, if you want to give something meaning, as in uh, you want to give space meaning, you need an anchor, as in magnetic north. You need position of pieces relative to each other uh, in reference to the anchor. And then you need something else, which is known as consistency of movement. So you need this is north, south, east or west of this. But you also need if I'm going north, I'm going north. If I'm going south, I'm going south. I'm not randomly teleporting around the area. Now, if you've got that, then now space has meaning. And because of that, these are actually very good at describing landscapes, whether it's a geographic landscape or whether it's a competitive landscape. So I thought, oh, well, I don't have any maps of my business. I have graphs, but no maps. So I thought, right, I need to create a map. I actually um, thought that this is what obviously people learn to do at MBAs. Um, it's it's <laughs> I much later discovered they didn't. Uh, the, um, uh, the mapping stuff is now taught at Harvard Kennedy, London School of Economics, Peking University, Moscow Institute. So it, it, it's spread all over the world. But um, back then, and this was 2005, I mean, I, I just sort of assumed that's what you've learned. I've never done an MBA. So I started off, I needed to create anchor position movement. And being a Brit, I like tea shops. I started with a cup of tea. I thought for the anchor, I'm gonna have the public who consumes tea and I'll have the business who's hopefully selling cups of tea. So it's a tea shop. Now you're gonna have other anchors like the regulators, etc. but we'll start simple. So I have the public have a need, we hope for a cup of tea and the business has a need to sell cups of tea. But a cup of tea has needs. It needs a cup, it needs tea, it needs hot water and hot water needs a kettle and cold water. 
and a kettle needs power. So what I've got is a chain of needs. And the further the needs are away from me, the less visible they are. And that's almost a metaphor for distance. So what I've got is known as a partially ordered list of needs based upon two anchors at the top, the public and the business. So I've now got position and anchor, but I'm missing movement. Well, it turns out that these are all forms of capital and capital evolves. Uh, put it simply, uh, we start off with the genesis of novel and new things, then we get custom built examples, then we get products and rental services, and then we get commodity and utility services, all driven by supply and demand competition. So what I have to do is just simply take my value chain and put it, uh, align it according to that axis. And now I've got the concept of movement. So I've got, for example, you know, tea, very much commodity. In this case, I put kettle in custom built. So what's this useful for? Well, first of all, it's a map. So if I move any component, it changes the meaning of the map. Great. Secondly, it enables people to understand my assumptions about what I'm building and tell me that I'm missing things like staff. And somebody else might go, oh, you don't want to use, you could use robots. Fair enough, but at least we can now discuss this stuff. They can add it to the map. Somebody else might go, well, why is your kettle custom built? Surely you should be using a standard kettle. And somebody else might go, oh, it's brand exclusivity. Now we can add that to the map and we can challenge the assumptions we've made. Somebody else might go, well, these are um, all uh, uh, basically uh, stocks of capital and all the lines of flows of capital. So we can add metrics to this. And from this, we can create PL um, based upon that map. Great. Uh, the most important thing is it doesn't matter whether you're from business, whether you're from engineering, whether you're design, whether you're finance, what, what you happen to be. We, it provides a common language for us discussing the space. So I'll give you an example, very simple one. Uh, this is an insurance company and I'll keep within the tech sphere. So this insurance company, uh, this was gosh, about a decade ago, had a problem. Uh, they needed more compute. And this is their process flow. They would order service, servers would go into goods in, then they would modify, mount and rack them. But they had this bottleneck about the modification and racking of servers. Uh, so they came up with this plan. They spent six months working on this uh, for the use of robotics. Uh, they had a, a wonderful uh, you know, a business case put together, return investment calculations, uh, had gone through all these different vendors to select the right vendor. And you know, they, they had this wonderful plan for how to solve this problem. Now, they asked me, what, what did I think? And I couldn't go in and say, why are you using robots? Because immediately that's conflict. Um, and it's conflict because what they'd actually done is develop a story. And so this is the biggest problem that I see in organizations. Um, what happens is we tell everybody that to be a good leader, you've got to be a great storyteller. Uh, as a result, we say, you know, your story failed because you didn't say it in the right way. And therefore, you know, if you were a better storyteller, it wouldn't. So we've associated this idea of being a great storyteller with being a great leader. And the problem is, if you now challenge a story, you're challenging the person. So that's why they become highly political pretty quickly. So I couldn't go in and say, why are you using robotics? So I simply said, could you map it? So they spent about 15, 20 minutes, and this is the map they came up with. User needs compute, compute order server, server goods in. They went compute and product, a server and commodity. I could question, I could challenge that. And they went rack, mount, and modify. Now, what they've done is they put their assumptions down, and I can now challenge the assumptions without challenging the story and the person. So I simply said, why have you got rack and custom built? And they went, well, we have custom built racks. We have a company that makes them. Okay. So what are the modifications you're doing to service? Well, they don't fit our racks. So we have to take new, the cases off, drill new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit our racks. Oh, and that's the bottom. Yes. And that's why you need robotics. Yes. To which somebody in the, in the room just went, why don't we use standard racks? Now, this is the most common problem that I see people trapped by past stories and past context. So at some point it made sense to use custom built racks and they had no way of challenging the predominant story. 
And I see this all the time, people wasting literally hundreds of millions, if not billions, optimizing process flow, which is what you would do in the case of the robotics, and not dealing with the fact that things have evolved, which is what you would do once you map it and realize you shouldn't be using custom build racks. Now, these people aren't daft, and they simply track by context. And the way I often express it is if the user needs a slice of toast, would you buy a toaster for $40 or would you spend, uh, as Thomas Thwaite did, nine months lovingly creating a, a toaster from raw materials for about $1,000 and the first time he used it, it burst into flames. That's the toaster project. Well, obviously, you'd buy a toaster. But if the user needs some compute, would you use a compute utility like EC2 or Azure? Would you spend years, millions of dollars lovingly building your own cloud? And it was amazing, the number of companies who did that. Okay, so I'll give you another example. Uh, this is uh, HS2, High Speed Rail. It's a big, heavy engineering project. It's, it's railways. Uh, this is James Finley. He's a good friend of mine. Um, James needed to build the entire railway. He was the CIO of HS2 and needed to build it in a virtual world. Uh, the reason for this is it's simpler, well, it's cheaper to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we've got that wrong, rather than it is to dig up the English countryside. So this is the systems diagram for building HS2 in a virtual world. Now, James's problem was this. Uh, which bits do I outsource? Which bits do I build in-house? Which bits do I buy off-the-shelf pro uh, well, off products? Uh, those simple three questions in that diagram alone have about 387 million permutations. So how do you choose? So in government, what we tended to do was go, oh, let's outsource the whole lot, uh, but we won't do it in a big contract. We'll break it into small contracts, so lots, and where we'll collect things which are sort of similar sounding. Uh, so we'd have like lot one, contract one, engineering, lot three, back office-y stuff, uh, lot two, stuff about the user, user experience, and maybe lot four, infrastructure. So that's how we normally did things. And of course, we, get, you know, we had a long history of outsourcing failures. Um, James spent uh, a Sunday afternoon, decided to quickly map it. So he, this is the map he drew. And he sent it to me and said, how do I manage this? So this was 2012. I just tidied up the map a little bit. And of course, I'd faced this problem back in 2000 and, oh gosh, six. Uh, so I said, it's actually quite simple. Um, so what you do is because what we learned is extreme programming, agile in-house development was very good on the left-hand side. Uh, where things like Six Sigma and outsourcing were very good on the right-hand side. And uh, these days you would use Lean, so Scrum MVP is very good in the middle. And the reason for this is that on one side, you're about reducing the cost of change because deviation is normal. On the other side, you're about reducing deviation because that's not, you don't want deviation. You want massive repetition of the same thing. And that's what we mean by being a commodity. And in the middle, uh, you're all about learning and reducing uh, waste. So as we move from this uncharted space of the genesis of new things to this more industrialized world, it doesn't matter whether it's money, penicillin or computing, use different methods. So you just use appropriate methods and you just use that. So we said agile on the left, lean in the middle, outsource the stuff on the right, which is what he ended up doing. And it ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee because it was delivered way ahead of schedule, way under budget, which was fantastic. Now, normally in government, what we tended to do was use this sort of method of outsource it all, break into contracts. And I'll just pick one of these, lot one engineering. If I do the mapping form, that's the lot one engineering. I can tell you before we've even signed the paperwork, this contract will fail. And it will fail because the bits on the right will be efficiently treated because we can specify them in a contract and the bits on the left will always incur excessive change control cost because we cannot specify them. So what we've tried to do in a single contract, because we're not thinking about context, is specify a whole bunch of stuff which we can never specify. And of course, we'll get into a fight with the vendor and they can say, well, it's our fault because we didn't know what we wanted. And of course, disaster, as somebody on your side says, next time you've got to specify it better. You haven't got a hope. Anyway, we've done a lot of this stuff within government. Uh, this is uh, Liam Maxwell, a friend of mine, who's uh, a former CIO UK Gov. 
uh, or Her Majesty's Government, HMG, I should say. Um, one project alone, we say 425 million, about 1.5 billion in its lifetime, simply by mapping it out, applying the right methods. Um, but it gets better because if you have many people mapping, you can start to share the maps. So you get borders, police, immigration, you share the maps and you start finding the same components exist on multiple maps. So we start finding we've got multiple user registration systems. And so we often have duplication and we often have bias. And so we can actually extract these nodes onto a profile and we can see this stuff. Now, I've talked a lot about government here. Um, before anybody gets this idea, well, government is very wasteful. Um, the worst example I've got in duplication in government is 118 workflow systems doing the same thing. We've managed to build prisoner registration 118 different ways. Uh, the commercial, or the private sector, um, the worst I've got, well, we stop counting at a thousand. Uh, I've got a particular bank who've managed to build risk management over a thousand times. Any level of waste that you see in government is always far exceeded by that you see in the private sector, in the in marketplace. Uh, the levels of waste and duplication are just astronomical. Um, the, the government itself is often a bastion of efficiency. Um, so one of the other things you do learn is with maps is uh, having a bias towards data. And by that, I mean, what we, we tend to do is pre some challenge. So before we build something, we map it out and use the maps to challenge the assumption. And then we go and do whatever it is we're gonna do. And then we use post-mortem learning. So basically we, we have the maps, which we originally created. We look at what happened and apply that to the map and use that as a point of learning. You do that with something called spin control. Okay. So I've talked about origin. I've talked about maps. I'm gonna quickly talk about patterns. Uh, there are three basic different types of patterns. Uh, from that strategy cycle. There are climactic patterns. These are the economic rules of the game. There is doctrine. These are principles of organization. And then there's leadership. So this is where we get into gameplay. Now, the climactic patterns occur to everyone. Uh, they're just a consequence of supply and demand competition. Doctrine, you get choice over, but they're universally useful. So it's a good idea to do them. Uh, leadership gameplay is all context specific. So you really got to know your landscape, your environment, because there's no point flanking somebody if they're not there. All right, so I'm going to start with doctrine because I've sneaked a whole bunch of doctrine in there already. And doctrine are these basic principles. So it's, all, all that doctrine means is a collection of principles. So the first ones are know your users and focus on user needs, pretty obvious. Uh, understand the details, so understand the value chain. Great. Understand what is being considered. So a kettle is not just a kettle. There's a custom-built kettle and there's a commodity kettle and there's a world of difference between those. So understand how evolved the thing is. Uh, challenge assumptions. It's a good one. Um, it's easier to do that with a map because you don't have the politics of the story. If you challenge the story, you're challenging the person. Whereas if it's all down on the map, I can say, I think the map is wrong without challenging the person. It's having a common language, um, surprisingly useful and, and also surprising how we don't usually have a common language. We have things like, I don't know, PLs over here and systems diagrams or system graphs over here. And there's, there's no real link between them. Use appropriate methods. No one size fits all. Agile everywhere doesn't work any more than Six Sigma everywhere. I mean, that doesn't work. Remove bias and duplication. I mean, pretty self-obvious. Have a bias towards data. Now those uh, particular principles are part of this table of doctrine. There's about 40 universally useful doctrine. And all I've done is covered the ones at the very bottom they're the most basic of all of them. You know, things like having a common language, challenge assumptions, understanding what is being considered. And once you get good at those, uh, you'll find that there's even more complicated and sometimes complex doctrine above this, um, which is built upon those components. Now, most organizations are pretty appalling, even at the most basics. So they don't know their users, they don't understand their user needs, they don't even understand their value chain. And we've seen a lot of this with the, the pandemic as people have little understanding of their actual supply chain uh, within organizations. 
Right, so the next lot of patterns you learn, and uh, there's 40 odd doctrine, um, uh, are climactic patterns. And they're useful for anticipation. So I'm gonna show you a few of these because there's about 30 of these as well. So here's a basic uh, uh, map of compute circa 2004, 2005. User needs an application built on best coding practice, built on a runtime, built on an operating system, built on best architectural practice, built on computers as a product. That's roughly where we were, uh, 2004, 2005. Um, when you map, you can map many things. Um, where I've got Genesis Custom Product Commodity, those are just labels for what's known as stage one, two, three, and four. I mean, it's just stage one, two, three, four is fairly meaningless. Um, you have different labels for different things. So when we talk about practices, novel, emerging, good, and best, uh, you, can, you can map knowledge, you can map uh, data, you can map uh, even ethical values. So when we're mapping cultural systems, um, I just use these ones because um, I'm Genesis custom product commodity. I know that also means novel, you know, emerging good and best. They have the same characteristics, each of the stages just have different labels. So you can happily map, you know, applications, uh, activities, uh, data, knowledge, ethical values. And you need to do that stuff when you start getting into the world of digital sovereignty. All right. So very, very simple map. Um, one of the first patterns you learn is everything evolves. If there's supply and demand competition, it will evolve, which is why back in 2005, we knew it was all heading towards a utility. I must admit, I thought it was gonna be Google, turned out it was a bookseller known as Amazon who kicked it off. And that project was Chris Pinkham and others, which was based upon the idea of a good friend of mine, Ben Black, which was proposed in 2003. So you know everything's going to evolve. So we knew compute would become a utility. Um, the other pattern you learn is that past success breeds inertia. So what happens is we build up great architectural practice for the use of computers as a product that creates inertia. So the physical assets, you know, our data centers, our servers, our practice create inertia to this change. It's a bit like Netflix and Blockbuster. Everybody goes, you know, uh, you know, why did Blockbuster fail? Well, first, it, it was first with a website, first with video ordering online, and first with video streaming experiments. So Blockbuster didn't fail because it lacked innovation. It out-innovated everybody. Uh, its problem was late fees. So that's how it made a lot of its money, which depended upon physical stores. So it was actually inertia from a very successful business model. Uh, Netflix didn't have that problem. So everything evolves, we have inertia. And then um, as things evolve, what we often see is co-evolution of practice. So by that, um, best architectural practice for computers a product was based upon a characteristic known as high MTTR, high mean time to recovery. So it would take you know weeks or months to get a new server. So we did all that capacity planning, you know, M plus one, you know, disaster recovery tests. Um, as it evolved to a utility, characteristics change. Now we get low MTTR, so it takes seconds to get a new machine. So we get a co-evolution of practice. So we get distributed systems designed for failure, chaos engines, we can do continuous deployment because we're not waiting for months uh, for the machine to turn up. Uh, next pattern you learn is efficiency enables innovation, uh, simple componentization effect, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. And uh, so, for example, with cloud, you get things like Netflix. And then, of course, higher order systems create new sources of value and worth. OK, very, very simple. The um, point about this is I can take a single map. I can apply some common economic patterns to it. And I can then use that, discuss with others, and work out where we're going to invest. So back in 2008, we knew that where we didn't, I was running strategy for a company called uh, Canonical, which provides something called Ubuntu. Um, so we knew we didn't want to invest around architectural practices related to computers or product, i.e. servers and data centers. We knew we wanted to attack this utility market. We knew there'd be an emerging practice, but we didn't know what it was going to be called. It was Andy and Patrick who gave it the name DevOps uh, sometime later. Uh, we knew that people would be building on top. And so that's where we could attack. Or we could, you know, in, in this case, you might want to differentiate on your application, maybe. But at least now we can discuss where we want to attack and where we want to avoid. And so that's what we did with Ubuntu. 
Um, we were about two to three percent of the operating system market against Red Hat Microsoft. Uh, cost me half a million and it took 18 months uh, for us to take 70 percent of all cloud computing. So we're up against these total giants. They're the, they're the Persians, 140, 170. They've got all the money and everything else, uh, but we've got maps. Uh, so, so we were able to attack the space. And if anybody was in you know, here was in cloud, you you might have remembered that suddenly Ubuntu just took over. They, you were mapped. That's what we did. Um, of course, the emerging practice evolved, uh, eventually got a name, Patrick and Andy called it DevOps. Uh, the old best architectural practice for computers product got a name, we called it Legacy. Fair enough. Uh, then around 2014, the runtime Lambda.net has started to evolve. Um, well, sorry, the runtime as in uh, Lamp.net has evolved to a utility. So we've got things like Lambda, uh, so the serverless space. And of course, that's creating you know new emerging practice, new things are being built on top, etc. Uh, so from this, uh, we can see you know this is where we want to attack the blue areas, uh, the stuff now that we don't want to attack, you know, including things like DevOps. DevOps is now heading towards the new legacy. So the point about this is you learn another principle here, actually. Strategy is iterative, i.e. where you wanted to attack in 2010 is very different to today, which is now 2021. So 2010, you'd want to be, you know, straight in with uh, infrastructure as a service, and building up those practices of DevOps, and getting yourself out of, you know, data centers and all that sort of stuff. Um, these days, uh, you'd want to be tacking, tackling the serverless space and extracting yourself from infrastructure as a service and DevOps, etc. You want to be building in these new areas. So being Bit like iRobot. iRobot's one of my favorites. Um, so they have, oh gosh, um, millions. I think it's over 10 million connected robots out in the world. These are these uh, uh, rumbas. Um, they have, it's all managed. There are 100 land functions, 30 AWS services, no containers, uh, <laughs> no EC2, certainly no data centers. Um, and uh, the entire operation is run by a low digit FT, a full time employee, is six. Uh, okay, so, so for 10 or 15 million robots, and it's between 10 or 15 million, you need six people and you need a whole bunch of Lambda functions. And that, that's the world we're going into. Uh, so I've mentioned about Doctrine, there's about 40 of those uh, useful for organization, structuring how we're doing stuff. Uh, climactic patterns, 30 of those useful for anticipation. And then you get into the gameplay and there's about 110 of these. Uh, remember, most people are completely oblivious to all of this, uh, and they're oblivious to it because they can't see the landscape. Okay, um, so there's about 110 of these. Um, I'll just go one. Uh, one of my favourite games is something called ILC: Innovate, Leverage, Commoditize. So it's very simple. Um, you take a product and you turn it into a utility, and you expose it uh, uh, through an API. Um, so I wrote about this in 2005. It was for something we were building. And the reason why you turn it into a utility and expose it is you hope that other people will build on top. So we say, take compute, we'll turn it into a utility, we'll give it a name, we'll call it, um, I don't know, randomly picked out of nowhere, EC2. And uh, we'll allow everybody to build on top. Now, people will build all sorts of stuff. Uh, some stuff will be useful, some stuff won't. Now, you can't look at their data because their data is their data, but you have to build them. So you have to look at the consumption. You need to know how much of your utility is being consumed in order to build them. And that's really useful, that metadata, because it also tells you what's growing, what isn't. So you say, most people would say building kitten internet going nowhere. Some people building big data things, you'd suddenly discover by looking at their metadata that big data is becoming important. So you might now go, right, we'll take that and we'll commoditize that to a new component. We give it a name, I don't know, Elastic Map Reduce or something, we'll call it that. And everybody cheers in the industry because now they can build much more quickly because they've got multiple components they can choose, except for those people you've just harvested their business model and they go, oh, you've eaten my business model, they're a bit miserable. Okay. The point about this is you get everybody else to innovate for you. Your entire ecosystem is basically a free research and development lab. You mine the metadata to spot future patterns. 
Um, so you, you use the metadata, the consumption of your service and the entire ecosystem to spot what is becoming important. And then you basically commoditize stuff. That's where you focus on the right hand side. Um, and now your apparent rate of innovation, customer focus and efficiency all increase with the size of the ecosystem. So the bigger your ecosystem gets, the more uh, innovative, more customer focused, more efficient you see. Okay. And you can see this, um, I mean, no bones about this. This is uh, taken from a, an, an Amazon AWS uh, uh, presentation. Um, start with compute you move up the stack that's how we normally draw the sim that, that ilc model uh, they're, they're, they're great at this i mean them and the chinese government are fantastic and it drives innovation in a, in a system i mean people often say to me shouldn't they be broken up well it sounds a great idea but china's not going to do that to alibaba so all you're going to do is end up putting your systems way behind even further behind the accelerating program within china so you you, you know if, if you want to, if you want to be even further behind, go ahead. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's how you, it's just one method of playing the game. Of course, you can counteract this. If you understand your environment, you know how to play the game. Uh, but most people don't know any of these patterns, don't actually understand the landscape. Anyway, you can read about this in AWS's book, Reaching Cloud Velocity. Uh, it's the uh, second ever book uh, they've produced. They've now done uh, a third one called Working Backwards, fantastic book as well. Uh, this is a great book. It's got about 17 pages of mapping in there, including the whole ILC model. Okay, whoops. Let me just jump to head one. There we are. So just a couple of things to say about landscape. First of all, all maps are imperfect representations of a space. So, uh, you know, if you wanted to create a perfect map of, say, France, it would have to be one to one scale, which means the map would be the size of France, which means it would be France. So as a map, that would be fairly useless. So all maps are imperfect representations of a space. Um, now, the other problem with maps is like, for example, in this case, uh, the, the map is based upon a model. That model is evolution and all models are wrong. So two things you immediately know is our maps are imperfect and they're also wrong. Uh, the third thing you know is the maps don't tell you what to do. All they do is they show you a landscape to which you apply patterns and have that discussion to work out how you're going to play this game. Okay, so they're wrong, uh, they're imperfect, and they don't tell you what to do. But other than those three problems, they turn out to be quite useful, which is why we use them in geography and all over the place. Um, now, we've used maps in government and saved hundreds of millions, billions, actually. Um, great fun. Um, but, you know, it's also used in things like smart cities, a lot of stuff going on uh, in various places like the UN with maps as well. Um, I like these sorts of uh, areas of work. Um, so this is James, who uh, Finley again, who works with uh, um, RNLI, which is the uh, uh, lifeboats. And they use mapping to improve their communication mechanism. Uh, which got basically call out times down from about 14 minutes to 18 seconds, which saves lives. I like that sort of stuff. Um, this is another uh, air, uh, area that I like uh, mapping used in terms of uh, combating illegal fishing. It's actually also used in terms of um, uh, attempting to reduce things like the, the slavery uh, industry that goes on. Um, so to combat that as well. So that's fantastic. Um, I have friends, lots of VC friends who use mapping, but I, I particularly like groups like Upeka who operate in India. Uh, they're a startup accelerator. They've got over a hundred startups now using mapping. Um, I, th I think pretty much, uh, I think it was a 65% are um, uh, cash flow positive in under 12 months, which is like uh, uh, a remarkable figure. So they've been doing some great stuff, uh, really interesting stuff going on. Um, there's about 12 or 13, uh, there's more coming out all the time, things like flow architectures, books, which have heavy amounts of mapping in them. Uh, obviously, Reaching Cloud Velocity, the UN's Global Handbook on Information Technology, is just full of maps. And uh, my favorite example is The Puncher's Scrow. It's a science fiction book, which was actually written with maps. So Tao Klein um, basically mapped out the future, then used that to write a science fiction book. It's called The New Ready Player One. It's being turned into a, into a film at this moment. It's a bit like J.R. Tolkien, you know, wisely I started with a map. Uh, well, you know, turns out did the same thing, fantastic. 
Um, most of my stuff is nation state competition. This happens to be uh, uh, looking at the automotive industry, rolling it forward and various other aspects of gameplay that goes on, particularly China versus US, uh, you know, where are the bottlenecks, how, how's the game being played? Um, and the only other thing I will just remind everybody, it's all Creative Commons. Um, you just help yourself, uh, medium.com forward slash Wardley Maps. You, you just, uh, this entire book there. We also have a, a, a map camp event. Uh, last year we had about 1300 mappers from all over the world uh, joining it. Lots of interesting stuff from the UN using it to reduce global poverty all the way to space and other bits and pieces, how it's being used in various different industries. Uh, so we do have a conference um, uh, that occurs, but the source material is all Creative Commons. So that's origin, uh, how I got into maps. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I discovered I didn't have a map. I had to invent my own way of mapping and then later on discovered that other people didn't seem to have maps either. Um, there's a hell of a lot to it. There are climactic patterns, there are principles as in the doctrine, there is the, uh, uh, the gameplay stuff as well so there's a lot to learn far far more than can be expressed in uh, in a short conversation and at this point there's some other topics i could go into meaning organizational structure culture uh, or and all the way to digital sovereignty but we've only got about 14 minutes left so i thought i would ask are there any questions there's total silence Makes me think that um, has everybody left? Hello, Tom. Are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Uh, people should be using. Are, Simon, do you have access to the Slack channel? Oh, Slack oh, channel. Room, oh. A, room A is where we should be having. Uh, where it's where the questions should be getting. Oh first. well, can, can no. I? Can I? I don't. Ha I haven't. Um, so my apologies. Okay. I, I use Slack no all problem. the time, uh, but I haven't set That's up okay. that channel. If you have well, access, in that case, please... we can use we can use the chat. We can use chat here. That'd be fine too. Okay. Or you, if you could just through? read one out to me, or uh, actually, the thing is, uh, let's see. Alternatively, you know if you if you want, I could go through. Yeah. I'm not going to get through meaning, organization, culture, and sovereignty. I can have a bash. Do you want me to jump through some of that? Give us a plus one if you want me to talk more about these topics. Yes, that was really cool. Great tool. Thanks. Much appreciated. Do you want me to go through some of these? Yes. Right. So I will do. Okay. So um, let's have a look. Ooh, do, 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 do. There we are. Right. We'll start with meaning. Um, user application, right, so that was a map of compute. Um, and of course, we know that everything evolves. So compute went from being a product, servers, to being cloud utility, okay? Now that's what we meant, cloud, it was in computers and utility. Um, and of course, we got a co-evolution of practice. So we had best architectural practice, you know, as in disaster recovery tests for servers and data centers and then we got basically you know uh, devops uh, that's a whole bunch of practices which got bundled together under a flag of devops now there's a couple of tricky bits here because when we talk about best architectural practice and emerging architectural practice they both have a common meaning as in they're both architectural practices uh, but they're just different competencies okay and they're different competencies because the material is different. I compute's gone from computers of products, computers utility. So material is different, even though it's still compute, it has the same meaning. So let's put it another way. Let's think of anything. It could be penicillin, it could be, uh, uh, it could be money, doesn't matter. And we start off as something novel and new, the thing, and evolves over time to become more of a utility or a commodity. It still has the same meaning, as in, you know, it's a drug or whatever, it's compute, whatever it happens to be. But as it evolves, there are multiple material instances. So the first time we create teleportation is going to be different from teleportation as a product. It's going to be different when teleportation is more of a utility. Okay. So if we go and build stuff, it turns out that agile as a method, extreme programming, is evolving and it's a competency which is good for a particular material instance. And lean has evolved as a method 
to be good for that middle material instance. And Six Sigma has evolved to be really good. So it's gone from novel emerging good to sort of best practice for building that more evolved material instance. So the complication is this. Um, Agile, Lean, Six Sigma all have a common meaning. We call them project methodologies, but they are three fundamentally different competencies, all associated with a particular material instance. And unfortunately, um, the thing uh, will have a common meaning. Teleportation is teleportation or, or uh, you know, uh, penicillin is penicillin, even though we're talking three different material instances. And because of this, because we don't understand context, this is why we're always looking for the one size magic fits all, because there must be the magic, the method of project management, which applies to teleportation. Actually, the answer is there's three different competencies and it depends on which material instance we're talking about. OK, but because we don't understand context, we're always looking for the one, which is why you always get this agile everywhere, six sigma everywhere, semi religious debates. OK. Oh, we've only got three minutes left. I'm going to leave it there. Um, we've got, we could talk about organization, culture, and sovereignty, but it will probably take me about 30 minutes to do those. Uh, and, and with that, you know, that's getting even more deeper. Uh, so I'm going to say three minutes left. Uh, I'll give it a, I, I don't want to take up too much of people's time. All I will say, this stuff is all online. It's all Creative Commons. Help yourself. There's an entire mapping community out there. I see somebody's put a link list.wardleymaps.com. You'll find links to the entire community. Lots of wonderful people helping each other out. Lots of stuff going on with NGOs, etc. cetera. Um, and it's really simple. Just think about Think about uh, who the anchor the users are, think about their needs, understand the value chain, and then simply ask yourself the question, how evolved are the components? Don't worry about creating a perfect map. You can't, they're all imperfect. The most important thing is you put your assumptions down, give it to others and let them challenge you. All right, thank you very much, Simon. Enjoyed the talk. Pleasure. Thank oh, everybody. okay, good, 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 good. Anything, anything else? Thank you. All right, take care. Okay.